Greg is most of you know, and uh, I'm, I go to these smokehouse meetings, maybe some of the others do here, but I can't say I've ever seen any of you. Anyway, that's a great group as well. And it's how I found out about uh, Keystone. As a fun, uh, that's uh, Rodney and Alex, but um, Rodney also had his fiance, Shayla, Shayla, who couldn't make it tonight, unfortunately. But uh, anyway, it's just a cute story because uh, they, they work together. You guys are married. That's pretty cool. The flag is. Uh, and then I found out, oh my gosh, I said, oh, Frederick? What? Yeah, I had no idea. Never heard of him. I don't know how many years I've ever heard of Keystone. They're over there by the Maryland State Police. Got their own hangar. Um, so I'm just, I'm really, uh, I think you're going to enjoy the presentation. It's a really interesting couple of company that's got some high tech capabilities. And uh, so, yes, please join me and give a welcome to Rodney Allen. Hello, everybody. Like you said, I'm Rodney Buckland. It's Alex Jones. Um, I like to point out my boss is also in the room with us, uh, <laughs> Cassie Krause. Um, so I'm glad she could join us. But I'm a multi engine commercial pilot. Um, I'm the lead pilot with Keystone at the Frederick base. Um, Alex is also a commercial rated pilot, but he is working as a camera operator right now um, with the hopes of stepping into the pilot position. Yeah, so I gotta get my multi. Yep. Okay. Okay. The bug about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, so um, we are an aerial survey company, um, which means that we fly at this specific base and at Keystone, we fly imagery. So we're taking photos and we're also shooting LIDAR, which is the light detection and ranging, which basically takes like a 3D map of the terrain as we fly over. It uses a laser. Um, there's multiple different uses. We've you know, the most common is either governmental or construction companies will contract with us for a project they're working on for us to get imagery for them. Um, has been used, different types of survey has been used for agricultural use. That's actually how I got my start, was in a 150 flying agricultural survey. And they could, um, with the pictures, they could tell which field and where in the field was getting enough water and where it wasn't. And they said it, like, increased the yield of the crops by tenfold pretty much um, uh, but also there's some planning for like different buildings and stuff disaster response uh, and we do some of that here and out of some different bases at Keystone where you can kind of see the extent of the damage of a natural disaster or something like that um, self-driving cars use the images from us a lot to help with their navigation um, what makes the survey world different from your typical like Part 91 flights and stuff? Um, the ATC coordination, especially around here with the CIFRA and the Freeze and Washington's airspace and some of the restricted areas, there is a lot. That's honestly the hardest part is taking a job and sending it to ATC and getting them to understand where that job is and then getting them to understand what we need to do when we're there because we're not just flying over it. We're flying lines back and forth and we're loitering in the area for a while. So that can get very um, frustrating at times because there's just a miscommunication on what we know and what they know. Um, but and that even more goes when you're in, into the freeze and the CIFRA and it's even more constricted there. Um, the fuel planning, um, when I was in training, when I've flown, you know, I've gone and rented an airplane, I know exactly how much fuel it's going to take me to go from point A to B. And then you add your reserve on top of that, and that's how much fuel you take. Here, we have a lot of projects where we're just up until we run out of gas. And so you got to be on top of your fuel burn and your fuel planning so that you don't actually run out of gas in the air, but you stay up your maximum amount with reserve, and you can get the maximum amount of working time there. Um, that's one of the biggest differences that I've noticed at least. Um, unplanned trips, sometimes a project will come in in a different state and it'll be like a day to a couple days notice where you need to get your bags packed and we're going to shoot this project. Um, that makes it kind of fun and interesting. Uh, where most of the time uh, we fly twin engine Navajos and I'll get into that later in the presentation, but we're on oxygen for a lot of our work. We're 15,000, 16,000 feet, so you got to be, I never was on oxygen before I came here, so that was kind of a learning curve for me, get used to that. And then again, special use airspace with the CIFRA and the freeze. Um, 
I had started my flight training out of Leesburg, so I was sort of familiar with the CIFRA, but this with this coordinating jobs in the CIFRA and then especially in the freeze, there's you know the 15 mile ring and then there's the seven mile ring, and within the seven you have to have a law enforcement officer with you, and then in P56 over the White House you have to have Secret Service with you, um, and I've got an opportunity to fly with the Secret Service agent in P56 before for work, and that was really neat and kind of terrifying too. You know, everybody's <laughs> looking at you. <laughs> Um, here's some images. This is on Keystone's website, but this is what kind of a LIDAR mm -hmm. return will get processed and kind of look like. Um, it's changed off of by color. You know, the higher it is, the more red it is, the lower it is. But you can pick out, I mean, these are power lines here. Um, you can pick out really detailed of the terrain that we're flying over. Uh, I have a couple of these. This is just off of our website with the stadium here. And then this is of New York City. I believe this is like kind of the southern tip of the city. Uh, and then these, these are some of the images that we've taken. And they compressed when I put them in a PowerPoint. But they're usually really cl crystal clear. Um, this is over by Quantico, where the um, ship graveyard is from World War One. I'm not sure what that is. Um, so I got started in survey. I flew for fast aviation out of Merced, California. It was a job I actually found on Facebook after I graduated high school. Um, he was looking for some guy to come out and contract for a couple months. And I talked to him on the phone and he said, you know, why don't you come out, um, fly. We flew 150s and I didn't have an operator with me. It was just me and myself in the airplane and the camera system mounted to actually the wind struck. It wasn't internal, it was out there and it's battery powered. Um, and it just took pictures every, I think, three seconds. And then he had some sort of program that you'd upload the camera, all the pictures off the camera at the end of your flight, and it knew where the pictures were supposed to be taken. And it would just get rid of everything else and keep the actual survey photos. Um, but that was the agricultural stuff to learn about, like crop yield and stuff like that. Um, but it was in June and July, in Merced, which is in the Central Valley. So it was 110 every day and a 150. You don't, and with me in full fuel, you don't get much performance out of 150. Um, so that was interesting to say the least. Um, hot, very, very hot. Uh, here's the sectional for Merced. Um, I was typically on approach because um, Lemoore Naval Air Station is down there and we had a lot of, uh, see if I can laser. We had a lot of our sites was like these fields right here. Um, Merced's kind of up this way. So we'd come down kind of here. That was our main working area. And so when you were working near Lemoore, you really want to be on flight following because they, it was almost every two minutes you'd get two F-18s and then two more F-18s and two more F-18s that would be climbing up through where I was at. So that was, that was cool. It was a cool kind of intro to it. Um, these are actual airplanes that I flew up there. Um, Hotel Foxtrot on the left had a, a 172 engine that had been swapped into it, so it had a little more horsepower. Um, but that was my first paid flying job. Um, there's me, there's the camera, and it had this little clamp that would go on the wing strut, and then it would connect to that iPad, and the iPad has like a crop duster bar on the top to tell you if you were too far left, too far right. Um, but again, it was hot, and the iPad would overheat and either freeze or shut down. Um, and it was right in front of my face, and it was really, like, actually really nauseating because of how hot it was. And I, my vision was on the iPad. So um, then after that, I came back and I got hired at Tuck Aerial Surveys, and that's in Lonesome Pine, Virginia, um, near Bristol. Um, they flew Piper Navajos there and a 1981 Cessna 206 uh, non turbocharged. Same thing we do here, they did uh, photo and LiDAR missions. Um, it was a single pilot and I had a camera operator with me that he also ended up being a pilot, so we swap off. Um, so I ran the camera a little bit there too. Um, he, I would fly for one day and then the next day we'd go up, he would fly and I'd run the camera. Um, it was, again, out of Wise, Virginia. Um, there's our Navajo. It was a Navajo with the Panther conversion on it. So it got higher horsepower engines and the winglets and the four blade props on it. And then there was our 206. 
Um, the Navajo was able to shoot LiDAR and imagery. It had spots for both cameras. Um, but LiDAR, because, and you can kind of get more into this when you talk about it, but LiDAR, as it shoots a laser, you can't go too fast or else the laser isn't able to make it back up to the sensor to get actually red. And getting a Navajo slow enough to shoot LiDAR is a, is a feat. And it was not the smoothest operation in the world. Because uh, you had to have flaps, sometimes with a heavy enough tailwind, you had to put gear down. So you're flaps and gear out like this, trying to shoot <laughs> imagery and <laughs> LiDAR. The engines don't really like that either. Um, but this was a couple of my coworkers there. And then I was in the back. This is the LiDAR computer that we used to run LiDAR off of. And then the camera was run off of that stream. This was like an old uh, Toughbook laptop that um, I was in EMS. We used these in EMS too. But that's a touch screen, and it, you could adjust the like uh, shutter speed and all that to get clearer images. For the most part, it ran itself, but you're kind of there to monitor it. And here's some pictures of my time there. Um, we always cleaned. We were always cleaning. That's like one of the biggest responsibilities there, because it was just me and Aaron was my other pilot that I flew with. Um, and when we weren't flying, we were out there cleaning. Because uh, the exhaust would get all kind of grimy and stuff in the belly, and wanted to keep that off the camera lens and make sure we could get the pictures. Um, so this brings us to Keystone. Um, that's ripped right off the website, but I'm not going to read it to you. <laughs> but basically, it says what I told you earlier um, that we contract with other companies, you know, imagery and lidar for their projects, and we have bases all over the United States to accomplish this. Frederick's just Kind of one of them. Um, we have our main, the Keystone base, like Keystone proper is in Philly. They're at a northeast uh, Philly airport. And we have the one here, and we have one in Longmont, Colorado, one in Reno, one in Greenville, South Carolina, Jacksonville, Florida, Katy, Texas, and Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, and then there's a couple like people that float around. I know um, one's from Kansas. I'm trying to remember his, his name, but he's an operator. That I think he's based in Kansas. This is our hangar down by the state police. So we have two Navajo 325s with the counter rotating engines, and then we have three 206s. Um, the, all the ones that we have currently at our base are G1000 um, turbo 206s. Uh, they're 2004 and newer, um, so they're pretty new Cessna products. Um, Frederick's airspace, we're talking a Potomac approach uh, on 1261 as soon as we get out of here. And we, we file a CIFRA flight plan and we also send them, I send them an email with a list of DME and radials for our projects and then also a KML file that you could like upload to ForeFlight. They can also use that at approach. And so I'll send them an email and then I'll file a CIFRA flight plan. And when I get up in the air, I'll ask to open the CIFRA and then they'll go find our paperwork and have a list of our job sites. And they'll say, okay, you're good to go to you know, job one or job two. Or, um, and then pretty much that's the most thinking I have to do because they just give me radar vectors till I'm there, um, which is very helpful because it's very busy there. Um, and they, some of our sites are like a mile off the final of Dulles and, or a mile off the final of Reagan. And there's a lot of airliners coming in and out. And sometimes they'll stop them either high or low for us until we can clear out. And a big part of this that um, the operators help a lot with is time estimates. Because they'll every single day I get asked, like, how long are you going to be there? And they can look at the project and say, well, these lines are going to take two minutes to do, and the turn is going to take two and a half. And then give me a number so I can let ATC know how long we're going to be kind of in their way. Um, I kind of touched on P-56. Um, and the freeze, the freeze is interesting to do with an officer um, because the 206, we only have two seats in it and the camera takes up the whole back part of the airplane. And so I've, Alex has actually made a really good checklist for me to follow for the camera. Um, but I have to be able to select lines and stuff if I need to switch lines or refly lines when I'm the only one in there. Um, Cause I don't know much about these cameras. I know pretty much how to switch a line. So. <laughs> Um, the restricted areas, we get quite a bit of work in 4006, that's um, a Tuxton's restricted 
on the eastern shore. Uh, we hang out there quite a bit. Um, so the training process for the pilot side, and I'll, I'll talk about the training process for the operator side. Um, we have recurrent training provided by our own in-house training department. Um, it's usually done in Jacksonville at Craig, although it can be at any of the bases, but they have a good working relationship with the flight school down there so that we can use their Redbird simulator. Um, because our training is it's about a week long. We have three simulator sessions a piece, a ground school part, which is just a slideshow on the actual aircraft, and then we'll do a couple flights. One will be typically in the pattern, and one will be a short cross country. Um, and the simulators are all, it's kind of like an airline in dock training, but shortened and condensed and watered down because we're not flying an airliner. Um, but it's approaches. The first day is kind of getting used to how the sim flies and maybe flying one approach. And then the second day is three approaches and they'll start failing stuff. Um, cause with the Redbird, you can like fail different systems and we'll have to deal with that on the second day. And then the third day is your check ride. It's not a check ride, but that's what they call it. Um, and that's when you pass the sim and you pass the airplane and you're signed off in the airplane and you can solve it. Um, so if you want to talk about kind of how you guys are trained on. Well, to tap into that last little thing you said there too, where um, like the training where they start failing a lot of stuff. When we did, because I'm a commercial pilot now and I need to get my multi, that's, that's the next thing. But all of the training that we did, you know, they got to they gotta get you to fly. You know, we did 141 training. They got to get you to learn all of the ground knowledge and, you know, the air spaces. And they've got so much stuff to teach you and they kind of just need to get you to, move through you know you've got a certain amount of time they need to get you kind of pushed through you pass the check ride and then you move on to the next thing you move on to the next thing until you you've graduated and you're moving out of there and uh something that we didn't do a lot of was you know kind of obscure failures and things and i've heard a lot from everybody that's gone down to this company training and he can tell you more of like they they fail everything and they fail a lot of things all at once and that's something that would be really really useful to go through to know Okay, I've at least experienced this once, and I've had someone here to tell me, you know, this is how you would get through this experience. So if you ever did have it in real life, it's not the first time you've ever seen it. Yeah. It it very much, I, I enjoyed it because I learned a lot. Um, I'm a pretty low-time pilot overall, but I, it was a wonderful learning experience. And um, I don't know how many of you guys are multi-engine rated, but when I went through training and they did the engine like the engine cuts on full power on takeoff. I was like, I noticed that. Like the engine's dying. Like, duh. Like it's loud. It's gonna die, and you're gonna notice it. And in the sim, I the one of my sims for my the Navajo, I completely let the thing run off the edge of the runway because I didn't notice one engine was failed. I thought I had a cr strong cross one. I just kept trying to put more rudder in, but with full power on one engine, none on the other. It took me off the end of the runway. And he's like, Well, your engine failed. Like, what are you doing? So it. It's very eye-opening um, and a useful training. Uh, I have really no complaints at all about having to go through it. And we do it every year. Um, so there's initial training and then you'll go to recurrent. And you don't have to, you only have to fly the airplane once in a recurrent, but you still have to go through the, all the sims and the um, PowerPoint as well. Um, if you want to talk about kind of how so um, are trained here. With the, the camera operation stuff, we uh, we set up everything else to do with the job. So pilots focus on you know coordination and everything else like he's talked about. And then we have the operator that specifically is focusing on getting the jobs together, making sure that we've got the route figured out, we've got all the packets with us, we've got all the information we're going to need, and we're taking the jobs and loading them in the plane. We've got hard drives, the camera lenses are clean, and we've got our own set of checklists and things to run as well. And um, and then we go, if there's any problems with the cameras, we troubleshoot all of that and try to get things working. Um, that happens reasonably enough, I think. And it's kind of it's kind of like solving a puzzle a little bit because there's a lot of stuff that I don't know what it is, but I got to figure out how to fix it. And uh, that's kind of that keeps it interesting at the very least. Um, and it's it's very cool being on the pilot side of it. It was a, uh, it's, it's been a godsend being able to work in, at a flying job and not have the certification to do it yet. 
because um, I was work, I was going to get my CFI, and on the day of my check ride, I uh, it was really cold in the morning. I was out there by myself. Airport hadn't really opened yet. FBO was still empty, and couldn't get the plane to start. It was so cold. And uh, one of the instructors said, "Well, if you go and turn the prop, you know, a few times, get the oil mixed up." It won't. Uh, it'll be a little easier to start. So I did that, and on the third time, third time's a charm. One of the magnetos, come to find out later, one of the magnetos wasn't grounded properly, and it fired. So I had primed the engines and put a bunch of fuel in the cylinders, and it fired just enough to hit me on the back of the neck and uh, knock me out. I was. I still had the phone call going, so I knew exactly how long I was out. It was about six minutes, and. Uh, Got a pretty good con concussion out of it, but that was it. So I walked away very, very lucky, um, but I had my medical revoked because apparently if you're unconscious, the FAA doesn't like that. So um, I had to, had to fight to get my medical back for a couple years, and by that point, you know, CFI was pretty far behind me. I had finished up on my college. It wasn't another good opportunity to get back in the seat. I kind of thought aviation was over. I, I figured I was going to have to do something else. I was working at PetSense when he gave me a call and said, uh, there's, an op there's a camera operator position opening up. I think you should take it. <clears throat> and I, he was right. <laughs> so here I am. And uh, it's, been really, it's been really fun. It's been really interesting. It's nice to be back in. And I'm kind of getting a way to warm back up to things slowly. You know, I'm always listening to all of the communications. And now we're in the CIFR all the time. I listen to Potomac talk, and there's so it gets so busy, and I'm I'm kind of getting good with communications now. Every now and then in the 206, I'll uh, I'll take up comms, and I'll do comms, and it's nice to be able to do that again. Um, and I mean overall, it's been a really good it's been a really good experience. And then on top of that, because I'm doing the camera side, most of the pilots don't know much that's going on on the camera side. So like that checklist I made. If I'm being honest, it was kind of for my own benefit a little bit because eventually I'm going to be in that seat and I'm going to be flying. And uh, if I have to teach some other people how to operate the cameras and whatnot, it'd be nice to have a checklist to follow to know what you're supposed to do. And it helps too when, um, like just today actually, I had, well, today and yesterday, we had uh, some of the newer pilots that are going to be operating in the CIFR themselves without an operator. We had them, I had was teaching them how to use the camera by themselves. And with that checklist, I just kind of said, you know, when you need me, just ask a question. But otherwise, see if you can do it by the checklist. Because you've got this to review, and this is all you're going to have at the plane. So if you can do it with this, then you're fine. You, you don't have to worry about anything. And so they can get through it just fine using that. So it's nice to feel like I can contribute something a little bit different. And I'm on both sides of it at the same time. It's very interesting. There's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that I've learned that I didn't even know. Really, I didn't know much of anything about survey, and now I'm I can operate a camera. I can lay out jobs, both lidar and DMC, and lots of different things. So it's been it's been a really good learning experience. Uh, I'll have you go into kind of how to lay like the process of laying out jobs. But the other thing that's nice about having a pilot in the operator's seat is they are you know, still a pilot, still thinking about aviation, but they're not overloaded and flying the airplane. So they'll catch radio communications they miss all the time. They call it traffic and they found it instantly because they're already looking. Yeah. And I, they see traffic that I've never seen. I, I mean, they'll come and go and I'll never see it. And they'll be like, yeah, I have it. It's right there. So that's really, really helpful to have this, just a second set of eyes up there. Yeah, that's probably the biggest benefit of being the operator and not the PIC. Because I get to look outside the window all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I get to look at everything. So that's always nice. So, um, it's all digital sensors now? Yes, it is. Um, that's a fairly recent thing as far as I understand. We were using actual film um, probably, what, eight years ago? Three. Okay, yeah. So it's been, because the, the image quality with digital has finally kind of caught up to what we were getting on film. So a day in the life um, of me as a pilot, and I'll let Alex try to talk about what they do. Um, I'll come in. We have a big sectional that's honestly about the size of this screen here. And they put dots on it that are color-coded 
with what type of job, whether LiDAR or imagery. We do have two different imagery cameras, so the separate between them as well. And they'll have the altitude and the um, job number and stuff on them. And that way I can kind of see where I'm going, see what I need to coordinate with ATC ahead of time. Um, check whether LiDAR without imagery with it can be shot under the clouds as long as you aren't shooting through a cloud or anything. You can do it, and not in the rain. You can do it really with an overcast layer. But most imagery jobs require you know crystal clear skies, and so we're looking at satellite images and four flight cloud charts and stuff to make sure that's going to be a good day to actually go attempt it. Um, then I'll call whatever you know Bravo or airspace that I'm going to be in and try to coordinate. I'll call the restricted areas, get an event number to show up there. Um, pre, then I'll pre fly, call for fuel, we'll go flying. Um, the operators kind of have a similar uh, setup. They they're also checking the weather, and I, I'll check weather for both the actual flying of the airplane, but also the imagery, but they have a deeper understanding of, like, that's going to be work for imagery today, and that won't work for imagery today. Yeah, a lot of it is, um, like, we can only do about an, an inch or two of snow. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of and it depends on the clients as well. So, you know, some clients are a little less picky. If we're doing a DMC-2, it's got a little bit less uh, quality than DMC-3. The DMC-3 is a newer camera. And um, I think most of the jobs that we have for DMC2 are they're a little bit less picky. If we do LiDAR, like we were talking about earlier, the, it shoots a laser down. So one, for like the speed that we were talking about, we do the 206 because it's slower. It can be slower, easier. And that laser has like basically more point density. So it can hit the ground more often times in a smaller area. Whereas if you're moving faster, it's got a lower point density. So it's got just less accuracy. And if you're trying to get that laser to go through snow at a certain point, it's just not going to be an accurate return. So, um, you know, we, we check for snow coverage. We're checking all the same kind of weather for aviation that they are. Um, at least I am because I'm using the same. I'm more comfortable with using the aviation weather sources than something else. That's what I practice with the most. Uh, and then cloud shadows. Cloud shadows are really big. So if it's a uniform uh, overcast layer and it's just a little dim, not a big deal. If you've got a cloud below you, it's in the picture, it's a big deal. Uh, and if you've got like scattered, that's, that's a little bit different too, is like I'm looking for scattered clouds now, which I didn't do before. I was always looking at overcast and broken. But now if we get scattered and it's anywhere over the job, it's going to be a problem because there's going to be all kinds of shadows over that job. And so can't do that because it's going to, it's going to mess with the picture. There's another thing there too, like I think we actually just experienced this on our last flight was um, we had some scattered clouds and I s swear we took a picture right over one of them. Well, we must not have. It must be outside of the AOI, the area of interest. So every one of these jobs that we get, there's a section of what they really want a picture taken of. But we have, you know, the oblique cameras and we take a wider area and we do overlap. It's 60% overlap. So every picture then the next one is taking 60% of the first picture, and so on and so forth. And they're getting the outside area of that, too. So if we take a picture and there's a cloud in it that's kind of on the edge or some one of the edges, it might be all right. We could go ahead and try to keep grabbing those images because if it's outside of that area of interest, it's not going to bother the client at all. And I think we just had that on our last flight, too, because we flew right over top of a cloud, and I didn't see it in the picture, but um, they got accepted. So. I don't remember if I got a picture of our actual cameras, but these are big cameras. I mean, they, they stand about that tall off the ground. They're okay, like 120 pounds. Uh huh. And then the mount, so they're they're gyro stabilized in a mount, so that I can't roll much, but I can roll a little bit and yaw. Uh, you, I can actually yaw more than I can roll and pitch, but it's basically five degrees left and right roll and pitch five degrees nose up and down. The camera is actually stabilized in that mount, and it will adjust for the airplane moving through the air. Um, so we have what's called an IP, it's an initial point. And when we hit the initial point, the camera unlocks. <coughs> they so can move. move freely. And then when we end the job, when we get the last exposure, it locks again. So that way it's safe for uh, while we're doing you know, the big turns and whatnot. Um, here's some pictures of some different, this is me training one of our new pilots, and actually AOPA's sim over here, they've been very gener generous to us um, and let us use the sim to kind of get people prepared to go to training so it's not the first time they're experiencing something like that at training. 
Uh, that's Drew again, one of our pilots. This is down in training at Florida. It's one of our South Carolina pilots here too. And then there's Shyla and a Philly-based pilot. They were ferrying one of the airplanes because they actually ended up switching airports at her training because um, I think the simulator there broke, so they went to a different one. Um, I did get a picture of our guidance system up here. So this system sticks in the, we just kind of wedge it into the dash of the Navajo, but it, it gives me a line. Um, you can kind of see this line here. It, that will direct me to the project. And then this yellow box gives me the altitude of the actual project itself. And beneath and above that box, it'll tell me how many feet high or how many feet low I am. And then once we get close enough, that line will switch to a different view where it's basically top down on the line and it'll show me if I'm left or right of it. Um, and it's mostly on the rudder. Once you, like he was saying, the camera unlocks, you're limited to five degrees. And so to correct things, you're stomping on the rudder and skidding all the way down the line. Um, and that takes a little bit of getting used to because you're used to always trying to be coordinated. And we'll be, we'll be sitting there on line and I'm still not great at intercepting them. And you'll overshoot the line, then you'll come back and you'll hit the IP like crooked like this. If this is the line you're crooked, and I'm just literally almost full right rudder, like trying to get that Navajo to straighten out. Yeah, and that feels real funky when you're sitting in the back of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that it's, the operators in Navajo sit way back here. You can yeah. see the, the seat would be like yeah, right here. This is the door. That right there is the wing spar. So they're they're probably 15 feet behind the wing spar. Yeah. So up front it might be like this, and in the back I'm like <laughs> flying off to the side. Um, turbulence is not fun in the back. No. It really. Is a rougher ride back there. Um, so this is this is the interior of one of our Navajos. We kind of have a we have an Aspen in this one. The other one is just steam gauges. We have a digital engine monitor in this one. Can you um, couple your your uh, path to the autopilot or no? You can't. Um, it's a separate system. The autopilots in the Navajos have been disabled, but in the 206s, you can. Um, in the G1000, we have the in-panel autopilots. If you turn the autopilot on, but you don't select any modes, it goes into the roll mode, and then you can select, you can leave it in roll, and you can select altitude, so you don't have to worry about roll, and you don't have to worry about accidentally bumping yourself up and down, and then you can just kind of assist it with the rudders down the line. So you can, but it won't, it won't actually like intercept it for you. Um, yeah. <coughs> help you. It won't fly the course line. Mm -hmm. yeah. No. And most of our lines uh, in the local area. Aren't long enough to even warrant it. We're online for maybe three minutes, and then we're doing a turn. So it wouldn't be like you'd be on autopilot for a short amount of time. Now, when I've had a couple trips, um, I've been to Vermont. I've been down to Florida a couple times, um, and out to uh, West Virginia. And those lines were 50 miles long, and I was definitely using that autopilot kind of trick on that because. A 50 mile long line at 120 knots is a really long line. Like you're there for about 25 minutes each direction. Um, let's see if I have some more here. So, this was um, West Virginia. I actually ended up taking one of our planes. Um, our we have three in house mechanics here, and they're, they do an absolutely fantastic job of maintaining our airplanes. They do in-house annuals, um, they'll put engines on it, they'll do pretty much everything. Um, and we had done an annual on 608, and Reno had an airplane that needed an annual done on it, and so we just swapped airplanes with Reno. Uh, I flew 72608 from here all the way up to Reno, Reno and then um, another pilot actually flew um, 254 back. So that was a really once-in-a-lifetime thing for me to get to fly a small single engine Cessna all the way across the country. Um, definitely a learning experience. I haven't been that far in an airplane by myself because I was just by myself. I didn't have an operator with me or anything. It was a, a really big learning curve. The mountain flying out in the western part of the United States is a whole different animal. And, so that was cool. Um, this was some from some of the recent training that we did and then the Navajo is when I had it up in Vermont. And your contrail down there at the bottom? <laughs> yeah. 
I didn't want to cameras? stretch a picture. <laughs> they all have camera doors on them? Um, so the Navajos do have camera doors, but they get the tendency to like get sideways and stuck. And then you end up having a door that won't open all the way or won't shut all the way. So they've been, they're open and they've just been disabled in the open position. Um, and it, it does get gusty back there. The, the camera hole itself sucks up wind. The, I mean, the Navajos are, I think, 76 models. So the doors don't exactly seal very good. Um, the heat takes a while to send it all the way to the back. It gets chilly at 16. Yeah. yeah. And at 16,000, it gets really they, cold. They back. look like World War II bomber. <laughs> um, <laughs> like three jackets on. They'll get, they'll get like jumpers and like, you know, the everything. You need a um, suit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is just some more. This was down in Florida. You can, all the storm lines down there. And uh, my well, operators took both of those. Yeah. I took the one on the left that was here. Yeah. And they were watching those, and then a flight we did down in Norfolk, the aircraft carriers. Um, this was down in Florida, too. And then that these, this was out west. That's kind of around here. I think that's Dulles in the background. And then that was down in Florida, too. I was down um, south of Fort Lauderdale, and we were I was based out of Pompano Beach, which is north of the Everglades. And we had just taken our last picture down in the Everglades. And we were coming up, and I think it was at like 7,000, and ATC asked if I could descend to like 2,000 feet, and I got down to 2,000, and then they said, you know, do you want to go around the um, west side or the east side of Fort Lauderdale's departures? And I was like, well, and it was going to be our last day there, so I was like, well, I'd like to stay along the coast if that's all right, and they're like, well, can you descend and maintain at or below 500 feet? And I was like, sure, <laughs> I can go down that low. So we were, I mean, we were 500 feet up the coast. Been like 170 knots up the coast. That was really fun. Um, so, if you have anything else to add, I can open up for questions. Yeah, I think we're good for questions. If anybody has any questions, ask now. So, I've seen other programs where they use uh, UAVs in mm -hmm. South America to look through the jungle. Mm -hmm. um, what's the difference between the kind of work that you do? Is it because it's a much larger area that you're trying to cover yeah and it's the ability to go places quicker and stay up longer and then carry a bigger camera um, is kind of why the airplanes are being used still it's the payload and it's also um, one of our Navajo Navajos has uh, nacelle tanks and we can stay up for like six and a half hours if we have it leaned out and we have all that gas so I mean we can I have my commercial drone operator's uh, certificate, and I actually kind of lied. I started surveying with a drone in California. We were inspecting power lines for wildfire prevention, mm -hmm. but those drones, um, we had like 25 minutes of battery, and we were constantly switching <coughs> batteries to stay up. So that's the biggest advantage to the airplanes is the range and the speed to get somewhere, too, is you don't have to pack up the drone and then drive somewhere. You can just zip out there, get a picture, and then come back. We had, I had one day where we went out um, to Michigan, shot a project, and then came back in a day. Um, and that'd be that'd be harder to do, unless you had a big network of everyone with drones. I think that once the technology gets further along, you know, and the battery life is longer and stuff, you'll probably start seeing that start taking over the actual manned aircraft. But for right now. Um, when you're out over a site and uh, such, what kind of speeds are you aiming for when you're flying those lines? So the 206 is limited to, on most projects, it's limited to 120 knots across the ground. Um, so when you have a tailwind, you gotta, you're got constantly, in a 206, you're constantly adjusting the throttle and the power settings and the flaps even to slow down and stay below that speed. Because like he was talking about the point, point density, you can't go above that. With images, the ground speed limit is 250 typically, and I just the Navajo is just a cruise with that. I don't have to touch it much. Um, but it's, the 206 is definitely more um, challenging to stay, especially in the winter when we're getting these higher and higher winds and stuff. But you're definitely you can be doing 80 across the ground one direction and 140 the other. So do away with the Aztecs. Uh, so some of our bases still have Aztecs. Um, South Carolina. South Carolina has Aztecs and the one the Apache. 
They have Apaches and Aztecs, and then Philly and Florida have Aztecs as well. Um, and Philly actually has a couple conquest uh, turboprops that they fly as well. So we kind of have a spread of airplanes. Yeah, so <clears throat> I was flying yesterday, um, and I was uh, talking to Potomac, and somebody was uh, basically called in to do survey work over Baltimore. And then there was some discussion ensued about paperwork. Did you file your paperwork? Yeah, that was probably us. We were up yesterday. Like 17,900? Mm, no, that was important. probably someone else. Yeah. Um, but they were, I guess it was a back and forth about, well, they filed their paperwork with the center because last time they were. Oh, so yeah, I was kind of yeah. curious what the paperwork was. So that's the, um, when I sent them the list of radials and DMEs, we have, um, John Hall is the guy that I've been talking to at Potomac, actually. We've ended up getting a pretty good working relationship with John. Um, he, he'll call me if he has any questions about our work, and I'll call him if I have any questions about being approved for something. But he's basically sent us this thing that says, we need to know where you're departing from, what aircraft, and call sign, and then uh, your gate into the CIFRA, so like Woolly Gate or Lucky or whatever. Then a list of your jobs with radial, like the radio off of you are, DME and altitude, and then an estimate the time you're going to be there, and then your exit gate and your landing airport. And then um, we separate them out with tail numbers because the 206 is typically fly LIDAR, Navajos typically fly imagery just because of the speed restrictions. Um, and then we attach a KML file um, that they can actually pull up and look in Google Earth about where they are. Um, and that's the paperwork that they're talking about. And they want that typically three days before the job, but I think the three days is more of a, a leeway that they've given themselves in case they can't look at it immediately. They, they're they just letting us know that it might be up to three days. But typically, if I send an email at 8 in the morning when I get into the office, I'll have a response by 10 saying, hey, I've got it. And they'll add it to their calendar, or the, their list of survey missions, and under that call sign. So then when someone does call up and they say, hey, it's... Um, 423 Alpha Charlie, we're looking for our, to open our CIFRA for survey work. They can just go flip through whatever they have there and find our site to see if it's going to be in the way or not. Yeah, this was, wasn't was over the CIFRA. They were calling basically a survey over downtown Baltimore so that wouldn't have been CIFRA. But it was like there was, uh, it was almost like they weren't going to give them approval to do it because yeah. the paperwork. That, so Potomac approach wants paperwork for anything in the Bravo or above it mm -hmm. um, just so they can coordinate all the arrivals and stuff and they'll they'll kick you out um, if you haven't done it right sometimes they just can't find it and they'll be like you'll uh, we call before we get in the air too at least we do here I don't know about it, everybody else but I'll call them before I get in the airplane just say hey we're gonna be there in 30 minutes and just making sure traffic's all right and we're not gonna be in the way too much and typically on the phone, they'll say, like, yeah, it looks good. We'll see you soon. And then you get up on the air, and they're like, who are you? I don't know. I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Uh, or traffic has changed, and they'll just say no. Um, because typically, I've heard that some other people, and when I wasn't working here, when I wasn't in the airspace a lot, because Lonesome Pine is in the middle of nowhere down there near Bristol, I would just tell them, like, it's... 20 miles off our nose, because that's what my system was telling me. But so 20 miles off the nose should be anything. You know, you could be 20 miles off the nose with a 50 mile line, but when they when you file paperwork, they can actually pull it up and see exactly where you're going to be, and that you're either going to be in their way or you're not. So they kind of can route traffic around you if they need to. So for the lines in that, you, is your system similar to that used for like by crop dusters that are doing big fields? If Pretty much. Um, it it will show you the lines and it will give you like a GPS line to the site and then once you get on the site more it'll, it doesn't give you the crop duster bar but it'll give you a similar basically it gives you the project line and it gives you a vector of your ground path and you just line the two of them up and it takes it straight down the middle. And then the altitude, it just tells you if you're low or high by how many feet. It's hard um, to camera. Yeah, yeah. The, that's one of the things, like, basically, what he's seen in the back, I have a mirror of up front. And 
um, when he changes a line, it'll revert up front to the new line. And, yeah, um, so we've got a we've got like the monitor, which is probably about that big, that deep, weighs a hefty 10, 12 pounds or so, and uh, and then there's a pilot display. It's about half the size, and uh, the pilot display sits up front. And then the monitor, either in the 206 we have on our lap, or in the Navajo we're sitting in the back, it's on a mount. And so when I'm, we're changing lines, or we need to change the direction of a line, or we need to shorten a line, or we need to abort, we need to change projects, whatever, I'm doing it on the monitor, and it's connected directly to the pilot display. Which so, is, the like I was saying about the 150 out west, with the Bluetooth to the um, iPad, the amount of times that you hear four flight or you'll hear four flight say like Stratus disconnected, but it would do the same thing to the camera out west where it would just disconnect and then I wouldn't have any guidance and I have to refly the line for no real reason. That's the best part about this is it's all hardwired and there's no interruptions. It's smooth. It's very, you know, it, there's the frame rate of it refreshing where you are is very, very smooth. So it sounds like you probably have a lot of downtime having to plan three days in advance and hope the weather cooperates and yeah. or you, everything's perfect and they say, no, we can't find your paperwork. Yeah, yeah. it can get really frustrating sometimes. And, or sometimes they won't even find your, find your CIFR flight plan. Like They have everything else, but they're like, we can't find your CIFR flight plan. So that usually results in us either going to flight service and trying to file one or trying to find a place that has service and... I'll throw my iPad back to Alex and be like, can you file Cifra again so they can find it and let us in? So yeah, it can get, um, that gets frustrating. But in our downtime, we um, we typically always have someone in the, in the office in case something goes, uh, like a project will come off hold that can be flown today. It's not in the middle of airspace or anything. And then um, we'll also be in there and we'll clean the airplanes um, pretty much once a week. We try to get the, doing it once a week now that everybody's trained up and is familiar with everything. Um, the Navajos get the gear doors dirty because the exhaust is right there. So that takes a bit of it up, up in GPS cards for all five airplanes, um, helping the mechanics out. They, you know, they're always more than welcome for us to go out there and help them with something. That's helped me a lot. I, I'm fairly mechanically inclined, but being able to sit there and watch them pull the engine apart and, you know, it's, they're very easy to talk to and they'll explain something that I don't know about or what they're doing or something, so that helps. Um, the pilots do have standby pay, so if we're not needed to be in the office, we'll be at home. Um, but like tomorrow, I'll have three of us coming into flies. Um, and that helps with, uh, for example, like I'm going on the road for about a month here in a week. I'm down to Alabama. And so getting that work-life balance kind of helps uh, being able to be home and then take a long trip. And it doesn't make you feel like you're a ways or as ways long. Yeah, and then sometimes we have a lot of jobs that, I mean, not often that I've seen so far. I'm still relatively new. But um, there will be some times, too, where we have a lot of jobs that aren't in the CIFRA. Yeah. And so they, they don't require any pre-coordination. We can just go and grab them as soon as they're ready to go and the weather's good. So there will be some days where we'll have like six or seven jobs down in Virginia, and we just go and make a day of it, make a big loop, and grab all of them while we can. So there will be days like that, too. Those are always fun because you basically get a tour of the state with some of them. Like we'll have some in like Norfolk, and then we'll have some over near Lynchburg and Roanoke. And so you literally just go all the way down all the way around Virginia, and that's fun. You get to see the Chesapeake Bay and then also the Blue Ridge Mountains in one flight. Yeah, it still amazes me how fast those Navajos go. Yeah. You know where all the best airport cafes are? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, miss, yeah. we're missing out on uh, Chesterfield when I shut down. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, I notice on Google Maps, when you look at the pictures, they change pretty regularly in mm -hmm. some areas. Do you also supply those pictures to Google Maps? Yeah, so that's one of the things that Keystone does. You, you can actually look, and at the, um, I think it's in the bottom right, the Google Maps actually cites where they've obtained their pictures from, and sometimes oh. I'll say Keystone. Um, the, typically, the 
Philly base takes on a lot of that. Florida does a lot of that too. Um, Florida sends a lot of their airplanes like on the road all of the time. We're more kind of based here locally and specializing in DC and stuff, but Florida and Philly will have an airplane in like Montana or something. Um, so that just because they're in based out of Florida doesn't mean that's where they're doing most of their flying. But yeah, some Google Maps photos um, do get come through and everything. How big are the hard drives in the camera and is it a dual backup? Yeah, so um, for the 206s, they only use two hard drives at a time, and we'll carry a case that have four in it. And the hard drives themselves are about that big. They, I think they hold, ooh, oh, man, uh, I think it's about 80 gigs, I believe. It's, it's, it's really not too bad. I, actually, it might be, i got to think about it. i got to remember now, because I, I remember also seeing the screen. Uh, I, don't, I shouldn't say 80. That's wrong. I think it's... I think it's four terabytes each, because That's when I'm looking at yeah. when I clear when I clear the drive itself, and I'm looking at the screen and I clear the drive, and it's completely empty. We've got almost we've got almost eight thousand gigs there of space to use. I think it's like seventy seven hundred. So, but so for the two hundred six, it uses two, and it takes all those pictures and puts them on both at once. And the Navajos, it uses four. So we'll take two of those cases with us. So that way we've got backups, and uh, it'll it'll put it on each of those drives simultaneously. So. Does Keystone ever do uh, dual beam radar mapping, or just in the lidar? Mostly in uh, imagery and lidar. The, there are some companies I know of that do that. I know I think Dynamic Aviation at Bridgewater does that, but I'm not super certain on anybody else. I have a buddy that flies with dynamic. Dynamic does like air, anything you can put in a King Air to do imagery. Yeah. Dynamic will do. So. Still doing the Jet Ranger? Um, yeah. Um, we'll put so for some of the lower and slower imagery jobs, um, the camera will go in the Jet Ranger. It's not on fly, but the operators will go along. Um, typically, the guys from the flight school will come down. On a whole lot of those country. No, no, no. I think ours was the first one in the like in the country to be able to have a camera. In. So, but yeah, that's the, the digital sensor. Yeah, yeah, it's the same. So um, they'll just pull it out of the Navajo and stick it in the uh, Jet Ranger. That's the other thing the operators do is like during an annual or hundred hour, they have to pull the camera out so they can do the inspection. Or if an airplane goes down, they'll pull the camera out, and that's all all what they do. They'll they can pull a camera out and install another airplane in probably an hour or so. Uh, we can do it faster than that. <laughs> but it's, it's a lot. It's over my head. It's a lot of cables and stuff. Yeah, it, it took me a while to get kind of figured out where each thing goes. But luckily, a lot of them, um, they're either color-coded or you can check the end. There's a lot of like unique kind of plugs. And so there's only a few places that one can really go. And once you get those ones figured out, then... Are the same, then you know well, the rest of them can only go like one place. So you figure that out pretty quick. But uh, yeah, pulling one of those cameras, they're like uh, probably on the ground. They're sitting like that tall, and pulling it out of the back of a 206, angling it. That's terrible. It's like a hundred pounds, and you got somebody on this side, and you no put it over on the yeah. thing. Yeah, it's when it costs more than my life is worth. So yeah, they'll, they'll <laughs> yeah. call me over and they're like, "Can you help me hold this?" And I'm like. <laughs> Maybe. Like. I think they're like 1.2 million, I believe, oh, per camera. And the lighter units, really. Well. So it's, yeah, the, the yeah the lighter units. So the camera costs more than the plane. Yeah, it's fun. It's it's a little nerve wracking to handle that thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm guessing by your description of going over the White House and such, there's not too many places you guys can't go. Yeah, you can get a waiver for anything, pretty much. Um, <laughs> so typically, um, another one of my bosses, Travis. He's the one that's coordinating that stuff. Um, so he'll reach out. You have to get like a governmental agency or, or somebody in D.C. to like support your request for a waiver, uh, even for like the for, with the officer and the freeze and stuff. And so once they get that in hand, they'll send you the waiver, and it has all these like constraints of like you can be here on, from this date to this date, and uh, hide all the secret stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And stuff. Um, <laughs> you gotta have that on you too in the airplane, because if you have an emergency, they're gonna want to look at it. Um, 
it's the stuff over. We, you couldn't fly directly over the White House. You could be in P fifty six A and B, okay. but you couldn't fly directly over the White House. That was one of the things they told us. Like, and so the I actually had the Secret Service agent. I was like, just look down and make sure I'm to the left or right of the White House when I go over. Um, that was really a unique. Thing. That was like day two after I got trained on the Navajo. I came back and they're like, all right, into into the most controlled airspace right. in the country. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. That was, I mean, that was neat. I, I will always have that memory. Um, and the Wally, the Secret Service agent, was really cool too. Like him and I follow each other on Instagram now. So. <laughs> like, <laughs> Any other questions? Great. Thanks very much, Jay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.